Okay, so what I want to continue with from what we started off last time was talking about what is geography. And from this slide, you can see we can take the word, and there are all kinds of definitions. And many of you in your, in your writings to me have indicated you have a definition of geography in your mind. The word geography means to write about the earth. And the important things about geography is the study of place and space. So that's the concept we're talking about here. And when you're looking at place and space, one of the key dimensions that you look at is the location of something. So when I say, where is Houston located, one of you are going to say, oh, okay, then how can I demonstrate location? Then we develop maps. And so a map is a spatial device to help us learn location. But geography is also interested in looking at human activity. What's going on within a space? What's going on within a location? And the question is, why is Houston where it is? Or some people would say, why was Houston named Houston? So now we get into history. Now we get into biography. And so you look at geography as a relationship between human activity, the natural environment, and the relationship between the two. So there are three questions to geography. And what I'm going to try to do this semester is answer these three questions. And that's basically it. And those questions are where, why there, and why do we care? It's as simple as that. Where, obviously, is location. What are we talking about? So let me give you an example. The first thing, let's talk about something that's real in your life. Where is Crete? Where is Crete? Why is it there? And why do we care? Or in this case, why did this settlement evolve on this site? All right, now I'm going to step out of this site and go to a device to help us answer that question. Many of you can go to Google Earth. All right, so here we have Google Earth. You can download it. It's for free. It's a, it's a Google product. And so there we have... What realm is that? United States. North, America. North America realm. Thank you. North America realm consists of two major nation states. That is the United States of America and Canada. All right. So if I went up here to this little box up here and I typed in Crete, all right, I want to know where Crete is. And I click the search button. Uh-oh. Uh oh. Oop, there's Crete. Now I know that you're saying, boy, I'd rather be there. <laughs> it's probably, what, 80 degrees, you know, we have a nice sandy beach. You're out in the middle of the Mediterranean. There's Crete. How many of you, when defining Doan or whatever you say you're in Crete, you get a you get a look, especially from people outside of Nebraska, and they say, Oh, Crete? Are you you're in the Mediterranean? Uh no. So we have to be very careful. Uh, so I'm going to put uh, a comma, and I'm going to put this. I want Crete. Oh, my goodness. Crete, Illinois. Anybody know there was Crete, Illinois? Yes. All right. Now, the interesting thing is that's not what we're talking about. So, so that doesn't work. Again, again, we're talking about location. We've got to be more specific. So we're going to get rid of Illinois, and let's just now put in um, Nebraska. Home sweet home. Now, so here's Crete, Nebraska. Where are we on this map? We're over here, right? There's the football field, right? You see that? And then there's the communication building right there. So there's Crete, Nebraska. Now, my question for you is, why is Crete here? You want to know? Aaron, why is Crete here? Um, isn't it because of a college? 
Okay, is it because of the college? Does Doan have anything to do with why Crete is here? Did Crete exist prior to Doan? Let's ask that question. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't called Crete. Prior to Crete, there was a man by the name of Jesse Bickle and his wife who homesteaded. His house is still there. And if you're heading on uh, 13th Street West and you're going to the, you're going to the uh, um, uh, Tuxedo Park, okay, you know what I'm talking about? So you're, you're going toward Tuxedo Park. You see Christina's Mexican restaurant on the left, and you see the road diverges to the north. You go on that road. This is a field trip for you after class. You're going to go <laughs> over that road. You're going to go over some railroad tracks, and if you look to the north, You'll see a house. That's Jesse Bickle's house. He was the first white guy to live in the area. So who was here prior, prior to Jesse Bickle, do you think? Native Americans. Pawnee, Osage, other tribes that have occupied the area. There was a time where you could be where the observatory is and look down the hill. There were no trees. None of this area had trees when this was first founded. No trees at all. Most of the trees here were planted or brought in later. We're an arboretum. Doan was an arboretum. These trees were not native to this area. You could have stand, stood on the hill and looked downhill and you could see the Blue River and you would see teepees along the blue. This would have happened in the 1870s. Why did Jesse Bickle come here? Well, when you look at the map, is there anything important about Crete, about this area, that would encourage a white guy to migrate to this area? What? River. 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 What's the river called? The Blue River. Do you see it here? Now, if any of you have seen the Blue River, it's not blue, it's brown. Do you know at one time you could actually have a big boat up and go up down the Blue River? At one time, the Blue River was dammed, and I'm not talking about someone going, damn. I'm talking about it was blocked, and, and there was a reservoir. If you would have gone to Tuxedo Park, you know where they run the cars and race around? That used to be a, a, almost a lake, and the river would overflow into that area, and you would actually have river boats going up and down the Blue River. Wouldn't that have been cool? This is prior to 18, from the 1870s. All right, what's significant about the Blue River for Crete? What was so important about having a river here? Transportation. Excuse me? Transportation. Transportation. All right. So you're going to build a town. You're going to build it near a transportation line. The first transportation line was a river. And again, I told you Blue River at that time was deep enough and wide enough to be able to hold boats and clean enough to want to be in it. All right. Uh, Native Americans are already here. Why were, they, why were the Native Americans in this area? What's so significant about this whole area for Native Americans? And you can see it on this map. Farmland. Farmland. The, the natives that were living here were somewhat plains tribes. That is, they moved around, they hunted buffalo, but you're going to find more of them moving to the west. These were farmer Indians, and they were farming the areas and living off the land. Why did Jesse Bickle move here? Because he left his hometown of, his wife's hometown actually, of Crete, Illinois, and came to this area and built his farm. And so here he is in his farmland, and he builds his house, and he's actually sharing an area that's occupied by natives. All right? Then all of a sudden, more and more white settlers move into the area. The natives move west, north, south, whatever, to escape the, the influx of whites in the area. Uh, and so Jesse Bickle decides, uh, well, more and more whites are coming in. We're going to organize it. And so his first idea is, I got a great name. We'll call it Blue River City. Makes sense? Somebody, I don't know where the Blue River got named. But anyway, so he called Blue River City. And then guess what? And as you can see it, what is this? The railroad. So now there's a railroad coming off, a trunk line that came off the Union Pacific Railroad that runs smack dab through Nebraska. 
and they build a trunk line through Blue River City area. Why? Why do we need a railroad? You got a bunch of farmers, and what are they growing? What, what kind of crops do we grow in this area? Corn. All right. And other bean crops and whatever at that time. So the farmers were overproducing all this great stuff because Nebraska is great, rich soil, just like Iowa. And so now they're making so much of the crops, they can sell it for other than their own consumption, other people's consumption. So you want to get your grain to market. How do you do it? Well, you can put it on a wagon and haul it to the next major city. The next major city would have been Lancaster or renamed Lincoln. Uh, and that's kind of far away. So why don't we bring the transportation to... So uh, they decided to bring a trunk line of the railroad to Burlington, Missouri, that's what they call it, and that would run right through the area, and it corresponds to be right close to Blue River, uh, uh, the Blue River. Now there was also a mill right next to the river. You needed water for the mill, and the mill is still there, by the way. You know, When I moved to town in 1992, first thing my wife said, there must be a good movie on because I can smell popcorn. And I was right. It smells like popcorn. What is that? It's the mill. They're grinding corn. And, of course, that mill is running all the time. I don't even notice it. That noise. Mm, and I live you know, not too far away from that. And that, that noise, and occasionally they'll shut it down to work on the machinery, and it's just silence in downtown Crete. You're going, something wrong? The mill's not on. But anyway, the mill's there. The mill is right next to where the railroad runs because that's where the farmers would bring their grain to the mill. They would store it. They would mill it. Then they'd put it in a train and haul it away. Guess who built the train? Guess who worked for the Burlington, Missouri to bring the railroad through Crete? Thomas Doan. He's from Massachusetts. He builds railroads. Chief engineer of the Burlington, Missouri Railroad. He's from Massachusetts. The railroad company hires him to build a trunk line off of the uh, Union Pacific Railroad up by Plattsmouth, come through this area and reconnect to the Union Pacific further west. Along the way, they built little towns. A, B, C, Crete, D, E, F, G, A. You don't believe me? Drive. All those are a product of that. So Mr. Doan asked the railroad company, I got a great idea. All these white people are moving in the area. We need schools. Why don't we build a little college? But they need the land to build it on. So he asked the Burlington, Missouri, would you be willing to give me some land south of the railroad? And they said, yeah, we'll give you 600 acres. Great. Thomas Stone, 600 acres, and then Thomas Stone meets Jesse Bickle, and they become friends. Jesse says, I got a town. Thomas Stone says, I got a railroad, and I got some land. Let's develop something. And the two of them get together, and they decided Blue River City wasn't a good name. And so Jesse asks his wife what would be a good name for this city. She goes, it's called Crete. We're from Crete, Illinois, so it became Crete, Nebraska. And then, of course, Doan then takes the land. They put a school there called the Doan Academy, named after Doan. I guess if you're the big guy that gets the money and so on. And by the way, the first little school for Doan was not located on the hills, actually down the street from me. There was a little school called Doan Academy. And then it became Doan College. And then Thomas Doan became the father of this institution, which was named for him. He was one of the first leaders, the first president of the university. And there's the history of the college, 1872. So Doan... Crete, we are a combination together. You're right. We're here for geography reasons. The Blue River, the railroad. Native Americans, whites, farming land, all of that. And when I came here, Crete was about 5,000 in population. Now it's close to 8,000. Why? Because we are close to Lincoln. We're off the railroad, and we don't have passenger trains anymore. One time you had a passenger train that you could take from Lincoln to Crete. But now we have Highway 33, 6, and then out west, 77. So all of this transportation is a direct result of Crete.
So Crete is a product of geography. And the thing is, you can do that with your hometown. All you need to do is to ask the question, where did my hometown come from? Whether you're Lincoln, O'Neill, Strasburg, North Platte, Oatmaugie, Oklahoma, where I was born, home of uh, the Creek Indian Nation that were transferred from uh, uh, the southern part of the United States back in the 1830s. It all has a history. Geography is like all the other sciences. It's considered a social science, but it has kind of a hard science to it. And we have classification systems. If you're a biologist, you talk about taxonomy and kingdom and phylum and class, all right? If you're a geologist, you talk about the major groups of uh, 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 rocks, uh, sedimentary, metamorphic, you know. If you're a historian, you classify things by eras and ages and time periods. And geography, you classify things by realm and region. And it's all based on spatial, think of the word space, spatial criteria. So in this course, we're going to divide our planet Earth into realms. Now, our geographer, the textbook author that we're using, has divided it this way. You'll find other books do different types of designations. So the important thing is for you to know that we have 12 realms as defined by our, we have North America realm, Middle America, which would include the region of Central America and the greater and lesser Antilles, the islands that you hear about. South America, right? We're going to go over to Europe, which would include Greenland, which is not very green right now used to be, which is interesting, Iceland, part of Europe, all right, then we go over to Russia, used to be called the Soviet Union, now it's just Russia, then I'm going to come down to East Asia, which would include Mongolia, which is its own country, but it's within the dom domain of China, China is the biggest country, obviously, in East Asia, the Koreas, Japan, and the island of Taiwan. And we move to the Southeast Asia realm, which would include like Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines. Then we have South Asia, which would include countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh. Sometimes South Asia is, you include Afghanistan in that group, sometimes not. Then we have the Austrial realm, including Australia and New Zealand. All right. Then we go to Africa. Africa is in two parts, and we'll learn why. North Africa, Southwest Asia, is this area, kind of the dark blue. Sub-Saharan Africa here, two distinctly different Africas. Culturally, racial group, you name it. We'll talk about that. Then we come over, and then we're back over here again. So, oh, one more realm, the Pacific realm, which are nothing more than the islands. 10,000, 20,000 islands in the Pacific Realm. There's the 12 realms. That's what we're going to be studying. We're going to look at the largest geographic units, which are realms, and then you break the realms down into regions. And then you see realms and regions are both physical, in terms of definition, and human or cultural. So that's why we have the cultural piece that we, we talk about. So when we talk about geographical realms, which I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about the big picture, and then we're going to break it down into the regions. And then all the great clusters of mankind that now occupy those different parts of the world. One of the things that's very important to understand in geography is it constantly changing. There is no such thing as static geography. It is constantly changing. The world is a lot different than it looked like when Thomas Dunn was crossing here. Crete is a lot different. At one time, the Blue River flooded all the time. Once mankind got in there, they changed the course of the Blue River, which took away all its ability to store a lot of water, and so therefore the flood rights went down. So now I'm in a non-flood plain. Thank goodness, I don't play flood insurance. Uh, but at one time, the Blue River would flood all the time, and downtown Crete would be underwater. 
You're going to find when you look at these realms that you, they have these borders or boundaries, and I don't want you to think of them as like a, a line on the, on the ground. They're kind of uh, imaginary lines where you're separating realms, and sometimes when you're going from one realm to another, you have what we call a transition zone. So you may have black Africans here, Caucasian Africans here, and then you have a mixture here. So you have a mixture of the two cultures that are separated by geography and so on. So the transition zones exist in all the different realms that occupy the area. Obviously, we're dealing with maps. We're looking at scale. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. This is what we would do a lot more in physical geography. But you're looking at maps that take a whole region like this one, and then you scale it down to, we're going to have a map that looks at realms, and then we'll scale it even closer, where we're going to take a realm and break it down into regions. So Nebraska is part of what they call the continental interior region of the North American realm. And when we get into that, this is one way you kind of classify areas to be able to study it better. You break it down into little bitty parts. So Nebraska and Iowa are distinctively different than Oklahoma and Texas in a lot of different ways. Not just football. So when we talk about regions, we're going to be looking at the criteria, human characteristics, physical characteristics, and both. And then when you break down the realm into regions, those are smaller and more detailed. So this is a map that shows you each of the realms that we're talking about, and the subcolors give you an idea of all the subregions within the realm. So we can break down these, these regions into all these different areas and talk about how different they are. You can also break regions down into other things. Here is a map showing you agriculture in regions. Notice winter wheat belt. Now I'm from Enid, Oklahoma. So this is my hometown here. That's where I, when I moved from Oklahoma to Nebraska, I lived there. I was born in eastern Oklahoma over here. So this physical landscape of Omagi was a lot different than Enid. Enid was in the winter wheat area. And notice the winter wheat growing area goes all the way in, into Nebraska. Then you have spring wheat over here. That was interesting. Different growing season, isn't it? I remember being on a harvest crew and starting on my harvest crew in southern Oklahoma and following the crew all the way through Nebraska as we cut wheat. That's when I realized I was allergic to wheat dust. That was bad. My daughter lives in Los Angeles. So here's a map of L.A. How many of you have been to, been to Los Angeles? All right. Uh, interestingly enough, because California is kind of sideways on a map, really kind of hard to get north, south, east, west, right? My daughter lives in Burbank. And so when we had her wedding this summer, her wedding was in Ventura. And so we drove all the way across here. You know, it will say on, uh, you know, like 30 minutes from Ventura to Burbank, of course, when you drive it, it takes an hour and 15 because of all traffic and so on. When you talk about uh, cities, a city is developed, and you'll hear these words, hinterlands. Hinterlands refer to the areas outside the city. Okay, one of the things we're going to look at is we're going to look at the fiscal setting. One thing we know about planet Earth, and you probably picked this up from the How the Earth Was Made video, purpose of that was to show you that what you see on a map today and the location of the continents hasn't always been that way. And here is the way you can divide up the earth. If we drain all the water, you're going to find that these continents are riding on top of the earth and that is moving around, bumping her up against each other. Plate tectonics was a theory that came from another theory called continental drift. And then we know that to be true because along those boundaries where the plates are, there's all kinds of seismic activity, which you can see in red, which are active volcanoes, or black, excuse me, the black areas are volcanoes, the red areas are earthquake origins. So you can basically tell, 
you want an earthquake problem? Live in Los Angeles. So when I talk to my daughter, I say, have you had an earthquake lately? And she said, yep, we had one this morning. She's right on the San Andreas Fault. I'm scared to death that if that fault slips in a dramatic way, you would have a massive earthquake in Los Angeles. And by the way, Los Angeles and San Francisco are on two different plates, and they're moving this way. So Los Angeles is moving this way. San Francisco is moving this way. Eventually, San Francisco and, and L.A. will be across the bay from each other. Wouldn't that be hard for Dodger and Giant fans? It'd be easier to get across to the games. There's a whole set of theories that in the Planet Earth video they talked about. And um, plate tectonics was one of them. And I'm going to skip through this. The guy that thought up the theory that preceded plate tectonics, you saw this in the video, was a guy by the name of Alfred Wegener. Now, what I find interesting about this guy is he was a meteorologist, and he was studying ice flows in the Arctic, all right? And he looked at a map, just like we've always done, and he looks at the map and he said, you know, it looks like Africa could have been part of Af uh, South America could have been part of Africa. It's like pieces of a puzzle. Have you ever thought about that? It looks like you can put all those pieces together like a puzzle. Now, Wegener is a meteorologist. His specialty is weather. And he's going to make a scientific theory, which is the primary theory of geology. So you have an outsider in a science area creating a theory in a whole another science area. Wegener's theory was originally called continental drift. The, the thing was, he's saying, oh, then that means South America must have drifted from Africa and that all these other areas drifted apart over time. Then it raises the question, how did that happen? That's what a scientist does. You've got to make observation. You've got to prove your theory. So Wegener unfortunately freezes to death. You probably saw that. He freezes to death in the yard. It gets lost and dies. And other people take his theory of, of continental drift and work on it. And that theory then became, there's the, there he is right there, that's his conception of what Earth used to look like. Another picture, 200 million years ago, they called that big landmass Pangaea. Then over time, 70 million goes, and then here we are breaking up. Evidence? Well, like any great theory, you have to have evidence. Some of the evidence we've noticed is that if you look at the plant and animal life in Brazil and Africa, it's similar. Now, how can that be if they're separated by 2,000 miles of ocean? That must mean at one time those lines were together. And so we have all kinds of evidence now showing through vegetation and animal life and fossil that the planet and all those land masses were together. So you're going to build a process of evidence that made Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift uh, theory valid, and another th whole theory develops, which became known as plate tectonics. So that means the continents are riding on top of plates, and they're bounding and bouncing around over time. And Wegener made these observations Here's a weatherman making an observation that would become a major theory in geology. I'm going through here. Another bit of uh, evidence to this, World War II. Submarine warfare, and they're having submarines crossing the Atlantic, and they're mapping the Atlantic floor. And what do they find underneath the Atlantic floor? Ridges, mountain ranges, and, and magma coming up through cracks in the earth. They're going, what in the world's going on down there? What you're seeing is that crack, that ridge, runs right through Iceland, all through here, all down here, and that is magma coming up, pushing the plates away, and we know that, and so therefore, that would explain why these two continents moved apart, that would explain why this is moving apart, and if you want to go to Iceland, as you saw in the video, you could actually stand in an area and have one foot on one plate and one, and you're in that huge gully. So you're seeing all these evidences in geology that are proving this little bitty insignificant man in meteorology a theory. 
C4 spreading now could be proven by sonar. So when they created radar underneath the water, you could now map the ocean bottoms, and that's what that is. Ni 1968, they had a Glomar Challenger that went around gathering rocks on the seafloor, and that gave further evidence that all these theories of plate tectonics, continental drift, are true. So therefore, the Earth is moving. Now I know that you're saying, how fast is it moving? I don't feel it moving about the growth of one of your fingernails is how the continents are moving. But if you put that over millions of years, millions and millions of years, 4.5 billion years, you get to where we are now. In a billion years from now, what's going to happen? It's all going to come back together again. And that was the point of watching that video. We are constantly in movement. And what drives this planet is heat from the center and the magma flowing, pushing the plates. Volcanoes, earthquakes are all examples of that. Most of the mountain ranges in this world were created when two plates collided. Best example of that are the Himalayas because Andi India at one time was a piece of Africa, broke off and rammed into the rear end of Asia, created the Himalayas, one of the rockiest mountains in the world. The Andes Mountains were basically two plates, the Pacific Plate and the South American Plate creating the Andes, extremely rocky. The Rocky Mountains are a little bit different. They were created basically because when the Pacific Plate and the American Plate hit, it was like, the, like moving a carpet and it bubbled up here in the center part creating the Rocky Mountains, relatively new. An older mountain chain of the Appalachians. Notice the, mountain, the Appalachian Mountains are an older mountain chain, have been worn down due to erosion, don't look anything like the Rockies. But they were caused, again, by all this, this activity. Plate tectonics explains earthquakes, mountains, and volcanoes. Interestingly enough, where do people build their homes? In the areas of earthquakes, mountains, volcanoes. I mean, why do we have people living on the side of a mountain in Hawaii? You know, they're having lava in their living room, and they wonder why. Now, what's the one thing about Hawaii that's so interesting? It's very, very uh, grows. Beautiful flowers, plants. Why? Because the soil from volcanic ash is very fertile. And so over time, it breaks down very quickly, creates very lush environments. So you're going to find some of the best farmland in areas around volcanoes. You know where the closest volcano is to us here in Nebraska? Nope, closer. There's one closer. Isn't it Yellowstone? Yellowstone National Park. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Smell that awful <laughs> smell? That's a collapsed volcano. If that thing should blow up, we'll be covered in ash in seconds. Nebraska will be gone. Uh, and that is a possibility. That volcano has not blown up in a long time. So here are the different plates just to show you all the activity. So the next thing I want to talk about, and I, I'm not going to be able to start too much of that now, I'll drift this over into next week, is one of the elements of geography other than geology, which is the study of the physical aspects, is the idea of climate and weather. Because you'll notice what changes the landscape of this planet more than anything else is the effect of water, right? Houston area, the big blue, the Mississippi, the Big Muddy, Missouri. Water changes everything. Erosion, rain, snow, ice, and so climate is essential. So one of the things I had you do within this chapter is look at the influence of two concepts. One is weather and one is climate. What's the difference? What's the difference between climate and weather? Yes, ma'am. Over a long period of time, and weather is short. So the day-to-day -day act at the day-to-day -day atmospheric activity would be weather. Climate is over a long period of time, but how much are we talking about a long period of time? Mm -hmm. Ten years, five years, twenty years, hundred years, thousand years, million years. We hear the word climate all the time now, don't we? Mm -hmm. Everyone's talking about climate change. 
not weather change, but climate change. And a lot of people don't separate the fact is that a lot of people that are associating weather events as a climate event. So the hurricane in Houston, is that a weather event or is that a climate event? It's a weather event. However, the question is, hurricanes in that area over a period of time would be a climate event. Now, how many hurricanes have we had in southern Texas within the last 40 years? Interestingly enough, do you realize that this major hurricane, what, three or four that we had in Houston, we've actually had a drought in hurricanes for the last many years. Everyone was predicting we'd have massive hurricanes, massive tornadoes, under the guise of a theory called global warming, and it hasn't happened. We don't know why it hasn't happened. And then all of a sudden, bingo, Harvey. And then the question is, and you'll hear this on the news, was that global warming or was that a natural event? And some scientists are saying, well, that's natural. Uh, actually, we've been in a drought in, in hurricanes. The global warming theory scientists will say, oh, no, 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 that's because we are a warming planet. And then that's a whole other area that we're going to talk about. The point is, and I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to that, the material in the introduction chapter, which I'll talk a little bit about on Tuesday, even though we need to move into Europe, is the importance of scientists don't know exactly why things happen. Climate is one of the most complicated sciences out there, and it's a relatively new one. And so if you ever hear anybody say, oh, the climate, we understand it completely. It's, you know, there's no argument, this or that. Those people obviously don't know what they're talking about. Because most scientists don't know for sure, but they make educated guesses, they develop theories. So what I'll talk a little bit about when we come back on Tuesday is define the two arguments on climate relating to a theory that was created by a climate scientist in the 19, late 70s and 80s. And that's been going, that argument's been going on to the present day. It's affecting all kinds of things. And I want to talk about it because it's important for you to be able to understand the two theories, the differences of them. And it's very interesting, the climate debate is the same debate that happened when Wigener was arguing with geologists over continental drift. When he suggested in 1929, or 1930s, about the idea of the continents drifting, most scientists said, baloney, you're nonsense, you don't know what you're talking about, you're a stupid weatherman. The continents have always been there. And Wegener says, now hold it, that doesn't make any sense. And then all of a sudden, scientists began to change their thinking over time. Another example, we just watched the eclipse, right? The eclipse proves a scientific theory that was a challenge to a scientific theory years ago. The ancient Greeks had a, a scientist by the name of Ptolemy that said this. His theory was the center of the universe is the Earth. 300 years later, Copernicus, because of improved technology and the telescope and others, said, no, Ptolemy. Of course, Ptolemy was dead. The center of the universe is not the Earth, it's the Sun. It took 300 years to go from one paradigm to another. My point is, science does change. It may look like it's definite and perfect, and science changes. Ptolemy is wrong, Copernicus is right. How do we know Copernicus is right? The eclipse proved it. Who proved the eclipse? Galileo, Einstein and other great scientists use now the technology to prove that Copernicus, who made an observation way, way long ago, was accurate. Science changes. Skeptical views in science is normal. If we're not skeptical, then we're not going to learn. And so the climate issue that some of you are going to pick up in the environmental studies program or the science department or even the education program is a series of educated people disagreeing over why things are the way they are. My point is, on all of this, is we really don't know. So we need to be open to all these different theories because you never know. One man's theory may be next year's joke. Uh, and that's what happens over time. We may not live to see it, 
but uh, that's the way it works. Okay, so we'll pick up on this for next week, uh, and then I'll jump right into Europe, and we'll talk more about the region. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.